So this topic of life after limited or full-scale nuclear war and mitigations has been on a lot of our hearts and minds, and particularly myself because I've spent a lot of time in Ukraine. So I did some research and looked at some scientific papers on this. And basically this video was not very much fun to make because it went I went down quite a large rabbit trail and uh, thought process of what life would be like. So I believe that we are closer to nuclear war at any time since the Cuban Missile Crisis. I also see that there's a general apathy for prepping amongst most of my peers. I think governments are woefully prepared for a nuclear winter. For example, there's a New York video that basically tells you how to survive initial blasts but doesn't go into explaining the basics of like protection of yourself and uh, storing food. Um, there's a popular channel inside Russia recently that made a video on the nuclear threat. And in summary, this video will not increase your chances of survival a lot in case of a full nuclear war unless there is like political action for prepping and we'll go into a little bit of prepping later on. So what are we going to cover? So basically we're going to talk about the history of some of the weapons and some treaties, look at some warhead sizes, look at different types of research including limited nuclear war and full-scale nuclear war and some mitigations planning, for example government prep, personal prep and maybe just a word of spiritual stuff as well at the end. So basically a disclaimer is that I, although I'm a science graduate, I've been working in software engineering most of my life and don't, hadn't, didn't have a specialization in atmospheric physics. I'm not military trained, I had only four years in Royal Air Force Cadets and I class myself as a novice at British Craft and Survival. So let's look at some treaties and also the basically the historical breakdown of relations between America and the USSR. So in 1959 there was a kitchen debate where both the USSR and America had displays and uh, Vice President Nixon went over and had a jovial conversation with Khrushchev and I recommend you go and check that video out where they're cracking jokes amongst each other although Khrushchev isn't being gentle on him. And then after we had the Bay of Pigs where America threatened to or attempted to invade Cuba things became quite heated and some of the statements there were like um, the statement it's up to the US to decide whether there'll be war and peace and um, then Kennedy reacted with saying then Mr Chairman there will be war it will be a cold winter and that's basically talking about nuclear winter and Kirchhoff said that Berlin was the most dangerous place on earth at that time because it's so volatile then we went up to the Cuban Missile Crisis where America actually went to DEFCON 2 DEFCON 1 is actually, I think it's when they launched the missiles. And here's a quite an interesting chart where you can see the overlap of uh, Kirchhoff's um, reign or presidency with Eisenhower and Kennedy. And then when we had the, the Berlin Wall, we had Gorbachev and uh, Bush at the time there. And there's also Mao Zedong, which is, uh, I think he's got more lives to his name dead than anyone else, including Stalin and Hitler. I'm trying to fit a lot of information in these slides, so um, as much as I can, just to make it not too long a video. But there's quite a lot of points we're going into because, like I said, there's some pretty deep scientific papers that I looked at. So basically this guy called, um, I think he's Brian Toon, he made this research in 1983 and the leaders of the free world, basically, or America and um, USSR listened to him and on this model of the consequences of nuclear war and nuclear winter and uh, what happened was was that in 1987 we had this intermediate range nuclear forces treaty where they'd agreed to ban all the nation's land-based ballistic missiles cruise missiles and missile launchers with ranges 500 to 1000 kilometers the treaty did not apply to air or sea launch missiles and by 1991 the nations had eliminated 2,692 missiles followed by 10 years of on-site verification inspections. 
So basically, nobody wants a nuclear war, and there have been all sorts of various treaties that have been, been uh, started. Some have been successful, and some have not been success successful. So there was something called SORT, which was signed on uh, 24th of May 2002, and uh, the Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty of 2002 calls for the US and Russia each to limit their operationally deployed warheads to um, 1,700 to 2,200 by December 2012. And I think this was quite a weak treaty just because there wasn't that many verifications possible. Um, I mean, there's big documents about this that you can go and check out the history. Uh, there was something called the New Start, which uh, is currently in force until the 5th of February 2026. Each site, each state is granted 18 on-site inspections per year, not as 21 hours. And by actually, the good news was by 2018, both parties had signed their reduction goals. There was something called the Start 2, which was um, not ratified to basically remove these multiple um, re-entity vehicles. But um, unfortunately, that never actually was ratified. But it was, I think it was signed for, because eventually America being America and Russia being Russia, America withdraw from the ABM Treaty on the June 13th, 2002 in Russia. A day later, which is kind of sucks, because, I mean, the world would be a better place without these multiple MIRV, MIRVs. And also there was something called the Start 3, where it played also, um, but just the negotiations failed, but apparently it was a part of the 19... 98 video game Metal Gear Solid, um, but I couldn't actually find a reference to that. Um, and then also there's something called the the yeah the new startup was signed in um, 2010 in Prague, and you can see them there. There's the actual presidents George Bush and Boris Johnson signing Start Two, but that one we didn't actually see to complete, unfortunately. Real pain that one. And then uh, recently, since uh, the whole just leading up to the war in Ukraine on the 3rd of January, I believe, we had this joint statement of leaders of the five nuclear weapon states on preventing nuclear war and avoiding arms races. The People's Republic of China, the French Republic, the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and Northern Ireland, and the United States, consider the avoidance of war between nuclear weapon states and the reduction of strategic risks as our foremost responsibilities. We affirm that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. As nuclear use would have far-reaching consequences, we also affirm that nuclear weapons, for as long as they continue to exist, should serve defensive purposes, deter aggression and prevent war. We believe strongly that the further spread of such weapons must be prevented. Now that's all very nice and good, but you know, as you know, we had the whole Russian invasion and that really kicked off things again, tensions, so that this statement didn't really do that much good, really. So let's just talk about nuclear bombs. So we have the one that we all basically learned at school, the uranium bomb, where we have, you're basically, it's a, I think it's like a plutonium center. And, oh, sorry, I'll just look at this diagram. <laughs> so basically, uh, okay, so you have, okay, fusion and fission. And sometimes I get mixed up with them. So the, uh, the fission bomb is where you basically have explosions around a ring and they force the, the uranium together and that creates a critical mass and it creates an, uh, an explosion. The hydrogen bomb actually has two at atomic bombs in the one. So, um, fission, actually I get I got middle up again, sorry. So this is a fission bomb. The fission bomb creates the heat and pressure that de de detonate the second device, this, this uh, thing here. The egg shape is a critical advance of mineralization, reduces the diameter for better fit in the cone. So these are basically one of the multiple entry vehicles so you have like these ballistic missiles that go up and they split into like 10 of these these things and they have like 100,000 uh, tons of um, TNT yield so the um, the spherical fusion bomb the secondary is the most powerful because basically the um, the huge amount of x-rays from its first expression first explosion compress and heat the fission fuel in the secondary capsule and it explodes um, a layer of enriched uranium around this device fissions on the detonation, creating a, a third blast. So basically here, this is the, the fission fuel, where you have this plutonium, and then here we have this um, isotope, isotope, and you have a high explosive, which it compresses together and create critical mass. Uh, this is basically saying the re-entry vehicle protects from the heat of the atmosphere. And then in here we have the uh, lithium 
deuterate converted by explosion to tritium, uh, I guess from this explosion, an isotope of hydrogen, hydrogen bomb. And this is this something called the spark plug. And uh, the second most powerful fission bomb creates huge amount of equity from the first explosion. Compress and heat the fission fuel in the second capsule and it explodes. So, yeah. So basically, two bombs in one. Never been used in anger, fortunately. There was this thing that America did at Castle Bravo. And uh, I believe the yield was like two or three times greater than they expected, which was quite scary for those that were observing it. And then um, between 1951 and 1971 alone, there was... Uh, I believe 240,000 deaths. That's just from the, the testing, I believe. That's, that's, that's unbelievable. And then from the actual Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there was 135,000 deaths. But that's just basically from cancers and all those kind of stuff. That's stuff from fallout from these tests. That's just an unbelievably high number. I actually forgot, about, I wrote this a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, and uh, yeah, just reading that again is just, just shocking, really. Because cancer is like one of the worst, the worst ways to go. One thing that I did discover in my research was something I'd never heard about. It was actually something called the Gnonum and Sundial nuclear weapons. And these were actually in the Gigatown range. And uh, basically, the America and the USSR were looking at them. And I think they had basically back backed off because they realized that it would, in a sense, destroy the world completely. You know, even beyond the full scale, like nuclear war things, the, these this would, would cause unbelievable damage, even beyond the current nuclear arsenals. A 1963 study suggested that if detonated 28 miles above the surface of the Earth, a 10 gigaton megaton weapon, the sundial, could set fires an area of 500 miles. So, um, basically that could just, uh, incinerate the whole of the UK in one go. You might have heard of the uh, Russian bomb called the Tsar Bomba. That was uh, could that basically incinerated uh, an area of around, I believe, the size of London. That's what it could do. So you can see the craziness of that one. That actual bomb would have been about 24 tons with a, a length of 26 feet and diameter of over 6 feet. Um, that doesn't seem like that big to me because uh, that's scary that you can imagine... A 28, 26 feet bomb and 6 feet diameter could incinerate the whole of the UK. So there's a, a documentary, that, or sorry, a, there's a there's a basically a, an article you can go and read if you want to find more about that. But there's one interesting bit on that, where it's a top secret um, article by uh, America, and it go on, went on to read, then perhaps a full scale test might be made at Red Wing. The best fuel mixture hasn't been settled on. Returning to the subject of light cases, Dr. Teller mentioned the wild ideas of using uh, of using no case at all, just air. Turning to another topic, Dr. Teller said he would be he wished to comment on possibility of much much bigger um, bangs. So there were um, people back in our history that were in America that were into this sort of stuff, you know. Scary indeed. So I continued to look for articles on these uh, devices and I uh, come up to this page called Russia Beyond and uh, there were some declassified documents that revealed the US targeted population centers with high explosive hydrogen bombs which besides intensifying the, the Cold War led Russia to kickstart a massive buildup of its own. And there was a, a bit here that says the most disturbing part of the study is a proposal by Edward Teller the strange Lovian inventor of the hydrogen bomb to produce a 10 gigaton warhead that would detonate with an explosive power 166,666 times the bomb uh, dropped on Hiroshima. That's a lot of 666s six, six, six in there. Um, with clinical detachment, Teller instructed the power of his, illustrated the power of his doomsday weapon. A 10 gigaton weapon, by my estimation, would be powerful enough to set all of New England on fire or most of California. So just and that's just one bomb, and uh, later on, <clears throat> there was uh, Julius Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, agreed with Rab and Fermi. He co-wrote in the majority annex of the gag report. We base our recommendation on our belief that the extreme dangers to mankind inherent in the proposal wholly outweigh any military advantages that would come from this development. Let it be clearly realized that this is a super weapon. 
it is in a totally different category from an atomic bomb. The reason for developing such super bombs would have would be to have the capacity to devastate a vast area with a single bomb. Its use would involve a decision to slaughter a vast number of civilians. So as bad as the hydrogen bomb was, sanity prevailed and they didn't make these nutty weapons beyond the nutty weapons that we already have. So let's just talk about what it's like to experience a nuclear bomb. So the, the mess, basically the quickest way to go to find out is to go to nuke map and then uh, put in these values for the yield or uh, pre-selected ones. So basically here we have a, a, a bomb with yield um, 15,000 kilotons and uh, that's a relatively modest uh, yield to be honest. Uh, 15,000. Actually, 15,000 is, 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 is 15 megatons, which is pretty big. Actually, it's the size of Castle Bravo, I believe. So that would incinerate a large piece of Manhattan there. And there would be um, blast waves, radiation, fallout, shock waves going out to this, um, this massive area. So basically, if you're living within this sort of area here, you're pretty much cooked. And then if you're lucky, you survive there. And then if you're lucky, you avoid the fallout. So, yeah, so that's the, that. We all, we, all, we all know these effects, we all, we all grew up with the movies and that. And um, but what we haven't really seen is um, the education on the climate, what happens to the climate, and that's what we're going to do with the rest of this video. So, a lot of these scientific papers they talk about teragrams, and um, <clears throat> to try and get your idea around what a teragram is, it's basically a, a billion kilograms or a, th a million tons. So what does a million tons look like? Well, if you can imagine that you have uh, a thousand liters cubed, which is a, mil a million tons, then it would, in a sense, look like this here. A little bit smaller because this is 110 in, in Paris, this um, guard of defense or something like that it's called. And it's 110 meters. But imagine if this was a solid piece of water. That would be one teragram. <clears throat> now... If it was soot, it would be probably about at least 10 times bigger because uh, gases are around, I believe, a thousand times less um, dense. So if you can imagine maybe this 10 times bigger and being solid black soot going up into the atmosphere and then basically hanging around in um, orbiting the Earth. And uh, that is basically what is the main problem with a lot of these um, nuclear bombs and the research is that these, basically the bombs create these crazy fires that shoot up past a lot of the layers of the atmosphere where they would normally be uh, washed down with persisted precipitation and rain and basically goes into the orbit and uh, hangs around there for ages until they, they coagulate into larger molecules and then gradually come down to Earth. But we'll look at these in the papers coming up. So, just to get an idea of the, the, that doesn't seem that that big, but you know, if you look at like the weight of like the amount of metals that've been mined, this here is uh, three billion tons. What that would look like, and that's um, uh, that's all of the iron that's been being mined is, is that kind of weight. So we're looking at something that's um, one thousand tons, and so about. 1 million tons and about 10 million tons is what happens if you have like a war between Pakistan and and and, uh, and India and that basically causes a lot of mess up of the earth. So even just a relatively light amount of um, soot compared to the amount of weight compared to like other things we're used to you know mining it, it can really because it basically blocks the sunlight is why it's uh, so, so dangerous up there. So let's talk about um, limited nuclear war research paper that I investigated between, uh, when I say limited, we basically mean it's two, two countries, two separate or developed nations or small alliances. And uh, this uh, research, they basically use uh, computational physics and um, they use this thing called the Community Earth System Model. They actually use this for some of the full-scale nuclear research as well. And uh, it basically uses differential equations and this thing called ensemble simulations. And uh, it's all very, very heavy maths. And one of the reasons I, I kind of left <laughs> going from academia is that I wasn't didn't really want to become a mathematician. I got my degree, but I, I went to software engineering because it seemed like an easier road for me. But you know, I would have probably loved to have stayed on 
done a bit of maths if I was doing maths all my, my, my childhood instead of playing games, but it is what it is. So um, there is a there is a paper here that you can go and read, and uh, it's uh, it's this page here. It says neither Pakistan nor India is likely to initiate a nuclear conflict without substantial provocation. India has declared a policy of no first use of nuclear weapons except in response to an attack with biological or chemical weapons. And interestingly, Pakistan has declared that it would only use nuclear weapons if it could not stop an invasion by conventional means, so, or if it was attacked with nuclear weapons. So this here is uh, not uh, a sense of like, not of mad, because they would use nuclear weapons even if they weren't struck first with nuclear weapons, which is pretty scary to be honest. So basically, this uh, there's a paper here, and it's called "A Regional Nuclear Conflict Would Compromise Global Food Security," and I'll leave this link in the show notes. And so, a limited war between India and Pakistan with less than just one percent of the nuclear arsenal would cause the following effects. So we're looking at about a hundred Hiroshima-sized detonations with a 15 kiloton yield each on the most populated urban areas of India and Pakistan. Each detonation was estimated to incinerate an area of 13 square kilometers, with this scenario generating about 5 teragrams of soot. You remember what a teragram looks like. Uh, as smoke from wildfires and burning buildings entered the atmosphere. Declines in global mean temperature by 1.8 degrees centigrade and precipitation by 8% for at least 5 years. Crop models show that the global caloric production from maize, wheat, rice and soybean falls by 13, 11, 3 and 17% over 5 years. Total single year losses of 12% quadruple the largest observed historical anomaly and exceed impacts caused by historic droughts and volcanic eruptions. That actually surprised me that those, those percentages seem kind of small overall but when it comes to this start food being distributed around the world, small perturbations and the percentages can have massive effects, unfortunately. Colder temperatures drive losses more than changes in participation and solar uh, radiation, leading to strongest impacts in temperate regions poleward of 30 degrees north, including the United States, Europe and China for 10 to 15 years. <clears throat> food Trade Network analysts show that domestic reserves and global trade can largely buffer the production anomaly in the first year. Persist persistent multi-year losses, however, would constrain domestic food availability and propagate to the global south, especially to food insecure countries. So yeah, it's uh, it's pretty sad. So this is what your simulations and uh, on this. This is actually relatively recent research. This is actually the most recent research that I've looked at, um, paper-wise. So we'll look here in Figure A. We can see this is years after the conflict, and this is the temperature change. So basically, one or two degrees is quite a lot. You know, all these people talk about climate change. I'm still not sure of the science, but um, these this this one one or two degrees is a massive impact. So you can see here that after five years, and um, there is um, I think this climate forcing one to I'm not really sure what that is, but I think maybe it's some part of the the model they tested or something. But we can see here basically there's a dip and then a gradual recovery to the the mean, which is you know glad, we're glad because basically the soot would would basically fall down through the atmosphere through friction and other processes, coagulation of the molecules, and this is basically precipitation change. So we get a reduction in precipitation because of the lack of solar radiation causing evaporation, and you can see here the shortwave radiation change. And um, this uh, percentage-wise, as we're getting dip of sunlight between um, uh, 8% and there's long wave radiation which presumably pierces the atmosphere better by about 3% but it recovers eventually um, actually it goes kind of over recovers a little bit somehow so that in a sense is limited war and it kind of sucks now um, this is actually more of a research from that paper so they basically looked at um, patterns of maize impacts of maize is like a type of crop and uh, we can see here that how the various countries are affected. So where this war, Pakistan and India, it basically affects the northern hemisphere kind of more. But as you can see here, there's a yield of minus uh, 40 to 60 percent difference in yield between Russia. And actually Russia gets the worst of it, isn't it? And also Northern America here. 
and um, I'm not really sure what these grave grey areas are um, but it's pretty bad basically so an uh, interesting thing though is that some areas were actually increased so like this part of Africa and this part of the southern America increased uh, an increase in uh, in crop yield somehow I'm not really sure why maybe um, I mean you can see here that there is a production change there's like a dip in production and here it seems to have gone up a little bit in the Middle East, I don't know why that is. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to read this. Stuff. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a climate scientist. You can go read the paper for yourself if you want to <laughs> know exactly what's going on. That The full-scale war was more clear to me. Right. This is the bit you've all been waiting for. Full-scale nuclear war research. So, basically, what that is, is that superpowers are involved or major alliances. Uh, I could kind of leave out names to... You know, say that basically the most likely cause would be between um, China and America or, or Russia and, and America or Russia and China both against America. So basically the idea is, it seems to be like annihilation. They just want to totally wreck each other. Um, the bombing goes beyond cities and the military infrastructure just killing killing the actual public centres. We're probably going to have to, we're probably going to see some kind of like EMP blackout as well, which... Um, wasn't actually talked about in the papers I looked at, but I'm sure that there's further papers I can look at that as well later on um, in another video. And um, basically, fallout causes a uh, new ice age as well as radiation poisoning. So actually, it's a fallout plus the soot, which causes the, 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 the soot would cause the ice age, and the uh, the fallout would cause the radiation poisoning. That's something that I didn't actually research on. Didn't have time to research it really, but again for a future video. And basically, at the moment, it seems like my most, if not all nations are completely unprepared for uh, a long-term survival situation. About, about a decade, seven years. So historically, there are actually were some there was some like information that was released after the Cold War finished, and um, actually there was underestimation of the number of deaths. And uh, it's only recently they've really kind of really understood the the dangers of a, of a nuclear war, um, just in terms of the climate mostly. And uh, there was a 1960s nine study acknowledged that they were underestimating the resulting fatalities because the estimates were based on fatalities caused by explosive effects and did not include the impact of such factors as radiation and mass fires. These effects, however, were certain to cause many more um, fatalities. So that's very scary to think that even in 1969 they they were not taking into account the um radiation and fires because that, that if they did know about that then it would make them even less likely to launch so if they're basically thinking the only, the only problems are the blasts themselves which are perfectly bad as well you know imagine if london was, was hit with a nuclear missile how much everything would just change forever in the uk um yeah, doesn't bear thinking about. So there was uh, this first paper that I looked at, probably the most of all the papers. Um, in 2008, there was a study commissioned and uh, they looked at the the full-scale war of after SORT. So basically, SORT was that treaty we looked at. And um, even after SORT treaty reductions, the direct effects of using 2012 arsenals would lead to hundreds of millions of fatalities immediately. The indirect effects effects would likely eliminate the majority of the human population. Russia targets a thousand weapons. This is this is the simulations that they ran. So basically Russia targets a thousand weapons on the US and two hundred warheads, each on France, Germany, India, Pakistan and the UK. They assume that the US targets one thousand one hundred uh, weapons each on China and Russia. This full scale nuclear war was estimated to cause seven hundred and seventy million direct deaths and generate 180 teragrams of soot. We all know what teragrams of soot are. Uh, for burning cities and forest. In the US, about half the population would be within 55 kilometers of ground zero, so where the missile hits, and a fifth of the country's citizens would be killed outright. So-called green air gases could reduce the temperature drops. That's one thing that I wasn't in the research article, but I just thought about it a little bit, is that we're all, we're all, people are complaining about these greenhouse gases but actually, in a nuclear war, they would actually kind of, I think, maybe help keep the temperature of a certain level, but wouldn't help us with, in a sense, uh, photosynthesis with light, and I guess, but just help reduce some of the freezing. 
So this is the this is the paper um, that we looked at. That it's from 2008, Environmental Consequences of Nuclear War. If you want to punish yourself and go through several hours or days to read it, um, you can go to this link here. I'll leave it in the description. Right, so there's a lot of charts coming up. Um, it is uh, more kind of geeky, I can imagine, and it took me quite a well to process a lot of information, and I still don't claim to fully understand a lot of the 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 points in this article. So basically, um, they sort of compare the casualties from various parts of the country if they're using different types of bombs. So as you can see here, that the country kilotons explosions create an about I don't know. 10 times on, or 8 times more um, casualties in various regions um, based, based, on, based on the demographics and the layout of the population and China had the worst case where the basically 100 kiloton explosions would cause this nutty because most of the populations are probably based around these cities and they compared the suit um, so basically 100 kiloton explosions would cause crazy more amounts of soot in a sense and then we looked at the uh this is the amount of kilotons of explosions um of people affected so uh if there was say a thousand um i guess it's the number of 100 kilotons sorry I, I cut that off a little bit that oh, well number of 100 kiloton explosions so if there was a thousand kilotons then we can pretty much see that the most of the casualties are in china and you can see that there's a quite a sharp rise for a small amount and it sort of doesn't really change that much in terms of the, the characters affected unless you are in China and uh, actually the US as well. So I guess at a certain point where you know there's kind of flat lines in certain, certain countries like Russia because basically I think most of the people are already wiped out by this point in such a wide area. And then we looked at soot, so soot um, based on the number of explosions. Yeah, that seems relatively sane because you imagine most of the soot being generated in the cities at the start and then the cities are blown up and then it's sort of almost linear as uh, more and more of the rural places are hit where there's sort of less to burn, but still forests can burn as well. And so they also there was in that paper, there was some, some computational methodology where they look at um, fatality and casualty probabilities for well documented based on like previous things like in Japan and there's some equations there where it talks about like the amount of soot that's generated as well um, estimated from population databases and combustible material and then there's all this math here of course I don't have time to actually go and prove it or learn exactly how it works but basically it's a lot of this numbers are, are just programming and computational physics which I didn't actually do at university that much alright so there's some more charts from this one uh, let's go to the slides here so in that paper it talked about um, one nuclear submarine so one uh, single US submarine carrying 144 warheads and it's the probably 10 warheads in a single missile of a 100 kiloton yield could generate about 23 teragram of soot and 119 million casualties in attack on Chinese urban areas or almost 10 teragram of soot and 42 million casualties on Russian cities and so in a sense um, one sub of American standards could create more soot than in uh, India and, and China war we just go back to the slides where we talked about that so here is 15 there was only five tera teragrams so in a sense america one one nuclear sub from america could create like five like like five times as much <laughs> as the whole of a nuclear war between um india and pakistan which is just insanity really so if you're still watching after this point, I congratulate you. Probably the most uh, depressing video you've watched in a while. So let's continue with the uh, research. So this is basically um, the amount of reduction in uh, pre pre precipitation on the on the world. And so we can see here that there's um, a sort war, which is the, basically the full scale war. There's a 45% reduction in rain worldwide. 
just due to the lack of basically sunlight coming through the atmosphere. I mean, it's not total pitch blackness like it would have been with like the asteroid strike, but uh, it's still pretty devastating to the crops because crops need a certain amount of sunlight to survive and only certain parts of the world would basically create, be allowed to, to grow food and it's, it's a mixture between rainfall and also sunlight as well. So it's not like 45%, it's 45% reduction in food, it's probably much more than that. And this is the uh, the change in energy on, on the surface. There's something called uh, watts per meter squared. So in a sense, there's a 160 uh, watts less per um, salt war impact versus India-Pakistan one, which was bad as it, as it was. And then here we can see the number of missiles uh, versus time. So we can see here in 1985 it was like... Uh, 80,000 warheads and now it's probably reduced by a half or so um, I'm not really sure why that didn't continue okay it's 2008 okay so there's I'm not really sure what this looks like right now and here's you can see like the the growth and amount of countries um, over time that have nuclear weapons and um, South Africa seemed to have dipped there and then uh, um, that's when Ukraine was in the Cold War, and then it, they gave the nuclear weapons away, and then Pakistan came, North Korea. And then this one is basically the percent change in growing seasons, so this is really depressing. So in Ukraine, it loses 100% in a sort war uh, of its growing season, and Iowa loses 80% of its growing season, which is just dreadful, dreadful, dreadful. Um, words, words really fail how bad that would be. In the India war, you're basically talking around you know, like 18% or 15%. Right, so here's just some uh, more facts from that paper that I'll read out to you. So, because the soot um, associated with a nuclear exchange is ejected into the up upper atmosphere, the stratosphere is heated and stratospheric circulation is perturbed. For the 5 telegram injection associated with a regional conflict, stratospheric temperatures would remain elevated by... 30 degrees after four years, resulting temperature and circulation anomalies would reduce ozone columns by 20% globally. And remember, ozone is basically protecting you from cancer, from ultraviolet light. Uh, and uh, you're basically northern latitudes are with 50% reduction in ozone for five years, and then substantial losses carrying on after that. The calculations of the 1980s generally did not consider such effects or the mechanisms that cause them, rather they focus on the direct injection of, of nitrogen. And then another interesting thing that I read was, many research have evaluated the consequences of single nuclear explosions, and a few groups have considered the results of a smaller number of explosions. But our work represents the only unclassified study of the consequences of regional nuclear conflict, and the only one to consider the consequences of the nuclear exchange involving the, the sort arsenal. Neither the US Department or Homeland Security nor any other government agency in the world currently has an unclassified program to evaluate the impact of nuclear conflict. Um, so you'd probably hope that behind the scenes that these governments are studying the other effects of, of nuclear versus direct effects of the nuclear blasts. And another thing interesting I wrote where basically... Um, uh, a misconception that nuclear winter idea has been discredited has permeated the nuclear policy community. That error has resulted in many misleading pol policy conclusions. For instance, one research group recently concluded that the US could successfully destroy Russia in a, a surprise first strike nuclear attack. However, because of the nuclear winter, such action might be suicidal. Well, you can imagine like 80% different crops real around the world basically, I don't know, maybe a quarter of America would starve or something. Just it's just batty. Batty batty batty. Okay, so we're over halfway there now. Let's just keep going through this. <laughs> if if you think this video could have been made into two videos, please let me know in the comments below and I'll, I'll bear that in mind for future videos. Right, so um actually that, that I finished that paper and uh I went on to a more recent paper. And there's actually some good news here, even though we're using more updated models and physics, uh, it, there was slightly less um, effects on the Earth as there was some of these really bad predictions where you have um, your growing season re reduced by 80%.
So basically, you basically have to store food till you starve. So in 2019, there was this one called uh, Nuclear Winter Responses to Nuclear War between the United States and Russia in the whole Atmosphere Community Climate Model Version 4 and the, the God Institute of Space Studies. So they use this really up-to-date model. And um, they have comparable results, but instead of 180 teragrams, we only have 150 teragrams in the atmosphere following um, the, as the 2008 paper. So basically, 30 to 40 percent they found of sunlight reaches the Earth for the subsequent six months. The indirect effects would likely eliminate the majority of the human population, which is still bad, of course. The massive drop in temperature follows with the weather staying below freezing throughout the subsequent northern hemisphere summer. In IOF, for example, the model shows temperatures staying below 8 degrees for 730 days straight, i.e., you know, growing season, which is actually that bit there seems worse than the previous paper, and there's uh, still short versions of summer freezing for, for years after. Global precipitation falls by half um, by years three and four, and it takes over a decade for anything like climatic normality to return to the planet. And there's some interesting quotes I found here, basically that um, uh, climate models have improved since 2017 in terms of horizontal resolution, vertical resolution, and vertical extent, which is essential for accurate simulation of smoke lifting. And so basically they had um, better resolution in, in the physics engines. And um, there's something called um, self-lofting would allow aerosols to rise deep into the stratosphere, resulting in long-duration climate response. Without precipitation to act as a removal mechanism, aerosols would remain in the stratosphere for months to years, depending on particle size. And the 2000, uh, the earlier models they basically did not include this aerosol particle coagulation and growth um, for the lifetime of 4.6 years for soot particles in the stratosphere. However, simulations of massive soot injections of tens of thousands of um, so simulations of massive soot injections of tens of thousands of teragrams. So this is this is crazy. This is like we think 150 teragrams is bad, but when we're talking about that that asteroid that hit the dinosaurs allegedly, we're talking about tens of thousands of teragrams of black carbon following the impact that kills the dinosaurs. Showed that particle coagulation should occur producing large soot particles of greater fall speed. So, um, yeah, so particles coming together in the atmosphere, we hopefully will reduce the length of this nuclear winter. That's basically the only good news. Further details in this paper are that the world's food production would crash by more than 90%. Uh, in my lifetime, I don't think I've ever seen anything even resembling maybe this war in Ukraine. But uh, I don't know how much re reduction it is. Maybe 10% or something like that. And the reality there's people starving and uh, the world's going nuts. The wheat price of wheat went up. Like, I don't know, maybe 50% or more. In most countries, less than a quarter of the population survives by the end of year two in this scenario. Global fish stocks are decimated and the ozone layer collapses. China sees a reduction in food calories of 97%. France 97%, Russia 99%, UK 99% and the US 98.9%. That's actually worse than I remembered going through this, this paper. So here's some interesting points. So uh, in terms of the scientific method, they actually used uh, the Earth Community Earth model with something called the Whole Atmosphere Community Climate Model, version 4. For the atmospheric component, the model has a horizontal resolution of... Well, you can basically read all these scientific stuff here. Um, apologies to the people that are listening to this, if it's just audio, but uh, you really have to follow on the slides. One interesting point here was that an injection of 150 telegrams of black carbon would be far greater aerosol loading than wildfire contributions or any volcanic eruptions from the past 100 years, but would be order of magnitudes smaller than injections of black carbon into the atmosphere 66 million years ago. You know, allegedly, no one was there. When an asteroid impact caused much of the biomass on the Earth's surface to burn. And there's a point here that says that um, several modeling studies have shown that stratospheric temperatures would increase by more than 50K. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. That's probably, a, okay, 50 Kelvin, not 50,000. Um, so you get Kelvin, which is like minus... 273 less than zero degrees. Uh, actually, no, kel zero Kelvin is minus 273, I think. 
Oh, it's been a while since I did physics. Um, and stratospheric ozone would undergo total global destruction even for a scenario where five teragram of soot is injected into the atmosphere. And uh, there's actually a little diagram there that talks about um, the mean change in surface temperature over years. So here we have some more data. So on this chart here, we have the temperature anomaly over the um, the surface radiation, I guess this is an average. Um, so you can see here that the temperature drops by around eight or nine degrees for the first three years and then gradually increases back to, actually never really recovers to zero, doesn't it there, until even 15 years later. And then we have the radiation anomaly, which is the watts per meter squared. You can see that massive drop and then a gradual recovery there. So it's dropped by 100 watts. And then here we have the the um, solar flux. I'm not sure what that is. But they all kind of follow a similar pattern. Here we have the precipitation decrease in terms of the millimetres per day. So I guess minus 1.4 minus millimetres per day is a massive amount. And then here we have also the participation anomaly in terms of percentage-wise. So that's minus 50% for seven years. Dreadful. So here we, all, here we have the spreading of the suit. So here we have basically a nuclear war happening here. Uh, but it's all but it's all like gold. And then we see it starts off in America and Russia and then it gradually spreads more and more and more um, around the world after basically six days. So you can see that it's um, the amount of time it takes. So, okay, this is suit mass mixing ratio in terms of kilograms. So I guess the fires are raging and uh, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger and gradually... Um, spreads around the northern hemisphere like that. But interesting to see that it doesn't actually go to the southern hemisphere as much, just the way that the, the fires in the atmosphere flows. So then we come down to this chart here, which is the suit optical depth. Basically, this is the amount of sunlight that gets through um, through the atmosphere to it down to the ground. It's actually, um, I think it's a, a natural log of the ratio of um, incoming light and transmitted light. So basically, 0.8 is like, I think it's like, um, to your eyes it appears like 80% less light, but in reality it's something long, larger than that, I believe. Okay, so next slide. Um, these are basically, these are, um, this is like the amount of soot that's in the atmosphere per height. So the higher heights of the atmosphere is like lower pressure here. And then going into ground level, it's there, I believe. And so what we're seeing here is that we're gradually seeing less suit in the upper atmosphere but we're also seeing um doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah just a decrease in the amount of suit and then basically this is the the changing the size of the particles so basically at the start all the particles from the suit are kind of small then they sort of coagulate around this level here and then they kind of that brings the levels down um so as such as that and then here we have, I believe, the temperature. So the change in the global temperature per height. So as you can see, after the nuclear war starts, the upper atmosphere is heated. But you're seeing a cooling of the the lower atmosphere where we are at, unfortunately. And then there's these are basically two different models. So one model looks like this, and another model looks like that. But we're still seeing this cooling at ground level, and we're just basically seeing different ways the upper atmosphere temperature changes. So here we're seeing some cooling after eight years in most atmosphere, but on this model here, we're only seeing cooling in the upper atmosphere around year eight or so. This one here is the changes in global specific humidity and relative humidity. So this is the humidity anom anom anomaly. So in a sense here, it seems that uh, the humidity is de decreasing, I guess causes less rain and the humidity of the upper atmosphere seems to be increasing here. Um, I'm not sure why that is. I guess it means there's more water molecules being trapped in the upper atmosphere as time goes on. Who knows what's going on there in terms of the physics. And this one is actually, let's watch this again. So basically it's the, the mass extinction coefficient for different wavelengths and particle sizes. So this mass extinction coefficient, I guess, means that we are seeing a sort of sweet spot of ejection of the particles out of the atmosphere between this 
um, size here of about 0.1 uh, micrometer to this size here. And for some reason, larger molecules don't seem to go as f out of the atmosphere as fast, nor small ones. Uh, I get this is the sort of um, mass extension course from a different wavelength. So basically, the wavelengths means I think some somehow the wavelength of light affects how particles are ejected from the atmosphere somehow. I guess it's some kind of pushing thing, the momentum of the sunlight pushing against the marked particles. So I guess that's what that is. Pretty, pretty advanced. <laughs> this one's a zonal mean change in surface uh, light. So what is this? Basically, this is saying that um, at the uh, equator, and we are seeing... Um, I need to... I need to uh, To fix this slide a little bit. So this is the anomaly. We are seeing here a decrease in light, mostly around it seems the the equator. Um, no, actually, it's um, this is the greatest one. So we're sort of seeing uh, these latitudes, the sort of greatest decrease in light. Whereas at the poles, it's actually not as bad somehow. But there's these sort of hot spots here where the light is decreased. But you can see the the improvements over the year, albeit quite slowly. So I'll just actually fix it, size it a little bit so the next time I give this presentation, it's not off the screen. So this here is the growing season length. This is basically saying that we have a growing season length of about 100 in the first year of the, of basically the Western world. Africa remains actually strong and actually to the uh, basically, basically Africa and South America and Australia will be the places to live after uh, if there's a World War 3 you know because like the growing season here is still 300 days um, after in year 1 but you can see here that basically the growing season for the rest of the world is pathetic ok so let's just talk a little bit about prepping and survival so basically, we all know the the sort of what we need. It's sort of basic triangle: food, water, warmth, and rest. That will basically be our basic needs, essential for the next like ten years. If, if there's a World War Three, full nuclear nuclear war, and then basically all this other stuff here is a bonus. So I did a little bit of calculations of like how much food a person could store, and how much it would cost for like, lasting seven years. I used the seven years basically versus like ten years, and that's like some of these models are saying with the, like the growth seasons decreasing and all that. But basically, we we can relate to this thing in, in the Bible where Joseph stored seven years worth of food on seven good years, and then after that, the seven years of famine. So I just sort of picked that out of self interest as a Christian. So, um, would you like to eat, imagine eating shortbread for seven years? Well, this is, I picked shortbread because there's like survival food that you can buy, and that's like. The, the, the most cheapest and all like most dense food I could find to, to make this calculation. So basically, um, natural preparedness will take years for large proportions of unprepared proportions of population to survive. So let's give the world seven years to prepare for a nuclear winter lasting seven years on a level of Joseph in Egypt. And um, this is actually way really worse than the, the, the drought in Egypt, of course, because we have the whole world have the problems, so there's no, no way to trade with other countries. And then we have the problems of cooling and, and cold temperatures and also radiation. And basically, everybody out for themselves, tribal tribal warfare and survival. So basically, anything you can do to yourself will only really help in a limited nuclear war long term. And that's um, a pakavi if, if the, there isn't political action. So this is what I basically discovered. I went on to Amazon and I found this thing here that's just two months survival food for one person, 145 pounds. Um, actually, but then again, if everybody was buying this food, the, the price would increase, you know, astronomically. But let's just say that you wanted to repair now what you could do for to survive seven years. So the average adult male needs um, 2,500 calories per day or about 900,000 calories per year. So this thing here, it weighs about... 12 kilograms, yeah, 12 kilograms, and uh, it contains two month worth of survival biscuits and it fits in a box this size. So, if you wanted to buy this for a year, it would only need to fit within um, a space of 38 times 23 times 120 centimeters. It's basically just over a meter long 
and about the height of an average suitcase. And that would keep you going for a year, no problem, pretty much. Now, of course, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nutritionist, but you'd have to obviously supplement that with something because, I mean, although these biscuits give you a lot of what you need, in terms of vitamins, that you probably definitely don't want to go long term on only these, but this is basically for for the sake of this calculation. And only seven seven eight kilograms, but it's going to cost you about, about um, almost a thousand pounds. And this is basically some of the properties. So, like, uh, I think it's um, the biscuits you eat. I can't remember how it is, how many a day, but it's like I think it's like six of these or three of these biscuits, and it's like two thousand two and a half thousand calories. It's quite a lot. Um, really dense, really heavy stuff, and five-year shelf life, which is uh, not bad. I mean, I don't know how long it would last long term. If you wanted to basically use them ten years later, I'm not sure. They were waterproof and um, NATO approved. If you want to do it for the whole seven years, basically it would fit into an area the size of 38 times 161 times 120 centimeters. So it would basically fit into the, basically a, a quarter of a small room. And that would uh, be weigh 500 half a ton, and that would keep you for seven years. But it's going to cost you six thousand pounds, which I don't think is actually that much for uh, for the cost of that if you can afford it. But of course, I guess most people don't have a spare six thousand pounds lying around. In fact, in fact, myself included, and the vast majority of people would not be able to afford twelve thousand pounds worth for prepping. So. Um, this isn't really feasible, but it's just if somebody has the money and they want to do it, this is this is one way you could go about it. So um, really, we need economies of scale and governments to start, you know, manufacturing things like this in bulk if you want to prepare for it. So for a, like a limited nuclear war, then anything that's like bushcraft related is going to help a lot. So right now, you should really be thinking about when you're outside looking at insects, for example, that are edible. And most insects are edible, but go check online. Don't just go start eating insects because I think they're a good idea but basically most of the calories that are free outside right now are in insects and um, if there was a full scale nuclear war insects would basically be a luxury because they might only be around for like one or two years and then there's zero insects so the buffer that you do get if you don't not if you're not killed in a nuclear blast would basically be maybe one or two years worth of insects if you even know how to eat them and again then again I'd say probably 95% of the Western world don't know about insects and how to eat them. So we'll probably see a large amount of refugees from like the West moving to like Africa and like other countries where there's a larger growing season if there's like a full scale nuclear war. Um, so basically what kind of bushcraft skills are useful to know? But I always like to say what could you make with basically your bare hands? I know it's kind of extreme, but if I was in a situation where survival, I would I would go and look for like flint. If I didn't have a knife, you know, I'd look for flint rock, and I would learn how to make like axes from that kind of stuff. Because like even if if you have a survival knife, it might not last you like seven or eight years. You might not have the tools to make it because basically infrastructure will be destroyed for basically any sort of tertiary you know complicated industry. Um, there's not going to be any power in the Western world. There's not going to be people to maintain the machines. It's just you can make we could make videos and videos theorizing how this could be, and we might just do that as like intellectual exercise. Um, but it's not really for the scope of this video. This is just a light touch of prepping at the end of the the research that they've done. So, um, like I said, the after nuclear strikes, you're going to basically only have those that you have on you, or you can reach quickly. And most of our Western professions will be useless for years to come. Like stuff like, imagine like the, the technology for the, like the internet and computers and all that stuff. I mean, probably it would take the world, I don't know, hundreds of years to sort of regrow that knowledge again. If even the, like if, if any happened to survive, maybe it would probably be in Africa or just or countries like that. So, But hopefully we would get back to speed relatively quick to sort of restore <laughs> some of our technology. Then again, there's probably research papers done about that, but it's beyond the scope of this video and my ability to theorize right now. So, if we want to like reduce the cost and feasibility of this, we and uh, also there would be a lot of chaos. So, like if people had this stuff in stories, there'd be a lot, probably a lot of theft, and so it's just not really feasible for everybody to go out and buy this kind of stuff. We really need action from the local government. So, I had to think about this. So, basically. Right now, we need to advocate to your local municipality to secure and store high caloric survival food enough for up two to three years for everyone in your neighbourhood. Now, I would actually probably say that's that's well, it's going to be between one 
and one year for for a limited nuclear war, we don't probably need one year's worth, but then probably seven years for full scale. If it's a worst case full scale, then it's going to be like, I guess, ten years. Um, but hopefully, even if there was a war between NATO and America or America and China, they would stop before they released 150 teragrams. So anyway, if the governments are actually procuring the food and manufacturing and making it into proper industry, then it would be more cost-effective and lead to less private food robberies. Um, but it's better if your man- municipality can manufacture this food themselves and rotate expiring food to be used immediately in starvation areas. So this is something that could be done um, to help the developing world. So if you we could have this sort of um, pool of survival food, that we then rotate to countries to be used immediately once it's reaching their expiry date. So that would, in a sense, it would give us the food for for free, in a sense of like we, we reduce the amount of aid we deliver after those expiring years. We have this food that we can just deliver to areas um, right now, so there's not really that much of a hit for it. And there could be a tax for it, I guess. We could vote to say, okay, we see as the world tensions are increasing, Let's make it a little bit means Texas tax to try and protect protect ourselves from starvation, which is the the biggest problem. And also, of course, store enough food for your own family for as long as you want. I'll leave that up to you, whatever that is. So, in terms of food and personal stuff, well, if you want to be able to survive off the land, then I pretty much recommend learning what plants are in your immediate area. Learn how to can them, preserve them, store them. There's a lot of food that goes to waste just in general, and uh, you could basically harvest that food right now. There's an app out there called Seek, which I use quite a lot to learn local local um, plants. I guess right now, though, if you're in temp- more warmer countries, it's going to be easier, but still, there's pretty much survival food in most, most countries, even in Scotland. You know, like the brambles you can eat, there's like different types of nettles, there's like, there's just different types of, of things that you can forage for, but like that, that, said, that said, it's easier to forage in summer and spring versus winter time. I don't know if anybody, any survivalist could actually live off the land on a Scottish winter. I just don't know if it's possible. Maybe it is, but that's not for this this video to, to discuss. So, a little bit of thoughts about living in cities. Well, if there's going to be a nuclear war, cities are probably the, the worst place to live initially because most likely to be struck. Um, you're going to be in closer proximity to a lot of dis- desperate people are not prepared. There's going to be less nature and insects. And there's... Um, the infrastructure for like water will be years from repair. The pros of being in cities, it's sort of maybe easier to communicate and regroup in. There's with like low power radio, making your self defence tribes, which you should really be kind of doing now. Fallout, it's a lot, you're a lot better to survive fallout if there's, you know. But then again, the fallout would like to be closer to the cities, but it's easier to shelter from fallout within buildings versus outdoors. There's not much you can do outdoors apart from finding caves. Or digging large holes like a wolf, but then again, what kind of a average human can dig for its shelters out in the wild? I don't know, know anybody that would be able to do that well. So basically, this is as much as I really want to cover right now. Um, and so in future videos, this I might be able to talk about uh, how to acquire water when there's less sunlight for evaporation, purifying water if there's nuclear excess radiation, potentially for hundreds of years. I need to look at the papers on that. Um, how powered farming will be greatly reduced by energy infrastructure and EMPs. So how do we then survive after our rations have run out? That's another important question, but because of course we don't have all our all the machinery has been damaged mostly for mass farming, which has been able to support large populations in the world. That says the population of the world will probably be 90 to 95 percent reduced. So there'll be less need for that, but. You know, I'm just speaking, I know this, is sound, this sounds very callous, but I'm just sort of speaking in the number sense, right? So obviously it's absolutely horrible that 90% of the world has died. It's just unbelievable, but here we're just being objective. And then I'm also interested in finding what kind of plants require less sunlight for growing, because that would be a good good thing to start growing immediately if you um, after a war started. And then basically try and get some scientists on, on to talk about these things. So I do believe I, I talked, there'll be kind of something spiritual to talk about in this thing, but uh, I'm actually not really, I think probably that needs a video on its own because a lot of people watching this video might not really be interested in it. But basically, um, if you want my ideas as a, as a Christian, I basically do not think that the Bible prophesies that there will be a nuclear war as such because if you, 
a lot of the heavy duty stuff that happens in the end time in the Book of Revelations doesn't quite exactly look like a nuclear war, but then again there are some other parts of the Bible that talks about things that could be nuclear wars, so um, I will probably do a video f about that topic especially if you really want it. Um, my apologies if you're expecting something very spiritual and stuff like that here, but uh, I guess I could offer a little prayer just at the end to, to give us some, some comfort, so um, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray for us as we think about potential for nuclear war, nuclear holocaust, Lord. Lord, we do not, um, we really don't have words to say when we think about what this could look like. We just can't relate to anything like that. But Lord, you have a plan for us. You love the world. You came and died for this world. We pray that you would prevent uh, anything happening that would start a nuclear war. Um, if there is a war going to start, no matter what we can do, we ask that you would protect us and give us guidance for our families, what to do, how to protect ourselves. Um, but we just pray for the world leaders right now that they would have cool heads, even if they have um, conventional war, that there'd be enough steps and process um, that nobody would be able to start a nuclear war on one person only, but there would be a protection that this thing would never happen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you for watching this video. Nico's out. Bye-bye.